Cheshire City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. Talk stopped using public Wi-Fi, right? Really seriously rethink that. And he's also convinced me that I should have a VPN, a virtual private network for my computer. So if you, you, I'm actually in Australia. My computer, I am in Australia apparently, according to my VPN. So uh, this, and I seriously believe that some people will take away information from this talk that they will cause them to act. Because this is really, uh, as Bud said, I hope this talk proves to be totally useless and ineffectual <laughs> because I hope none, none of the th bad things that could happen do happen. But it's really powerful knowledge to equip yourself about the possible falls out from electronic EMPs and what it could, effect it could have on your life and your electronics and your information. As, uh, for instance, I had a guy just the other day I started talking about this talk was coming and he said, oh, I, all I have on my phone is my phone numbers, you know, so it gets fried. I said, well, that means you won't have the phone numbers, right, of all these people you might want to contact in an emergency, etc." So I'm hoping, Bud's walking the other way. I said something to upset him. <laughs> he might be, he might be uh, bringing up the PowerPoint, I hope. Uh, so, yeah, so really have a, have a very, very good listen to the information in this, and there will be time for questions and answers, but we, as you know, we live in an uncertain world where we're hearing about the possibility of nuclear bombs being let off in a way we haven't, in the world hasn't heard about for quite a while, and among other things, if you know, you know I know, um, I know uh, Brad Melrose's philosophy is you want to be at ground zero, just get fried, right? Don't, don't die of radiation sickness. But also you're, you could be further out and your electronics could be fried and that could be serious. So Bud, come and, come and open our eyes for us. Good morning, everyone. Apologize, I'm not used to uh, this microphone. So, um, I'm going to share one video before we start. It's kind of uh, get you up to speed a little bit of one of the three topping points I'm going to speak on today. But they're all related to one topic, which is uh, the risk today of power disruptions in our society. Um, we'll cover blackouts, which we're all familiar with, when the power is completely out, uh, brownouts, which is similar, where power is somewhat diminished, and then the final section, uh, which I think we'll get a lot of uh, discussion, is EMPs, which is uh, power that is disrupted due to electronic radiation interference. Um, it sounds like sci-fi, but I assure you it's a real concern today. Uh, could you play that first video, please? Again, that's a worst case scenario, but 
Um, I wanted to start that off to show you how serious this can be. Um, start the PowerPoint, please. <clears throat> Back in the 1950s, they had a marketing theme for nuclear war uh, prevention or how, how to protect yourself from nuclear war called duck and cover. So I'm using a little bit of a variation of that today to show how you can protect your uh, personal electronic devices that you may need after uh, EMP. And also, they can be damaged from a blackout or brownout, and how to know the difference between the three, because when they happen, they all may seem very similar. Next slide, please. Again, duck and cover was the uh, original topic, which, if you look at it today, seems pretty laughable that people would hide under a desk at school. Um, unfortunately, today, our society is far more dependent on any kind of electronics. If you think about our phones, computers, uh, connection to the internet, banking systems, ATMs, virtually everything is tied in computer. Um, this talk we just heard about talks about AI and augmentation. Uh, so if you have any type of personal implants, uh, whether it be uh, hearing aids or pacemakers, they could be uh, impacted from these EMPs. So this is quickly transitioning from just being a problem with your laptop to being a problem with your personal health. Next slide, please. So there's three areas uh, that we'll cover, as I mentioned. Uh, the, the main one that will impact all of us in the near future is power outages. Um, a large part of the world is currently looking at a lot of supply chain issues, uh, energy shortages, and we're expecting in North America, Europe, and other places uh, a number of blackouts or brownouts uh, over the next several years due to power problems. Um, the main issue is the electrical grid because these are very susceptible to damage and a single point of failure can impact uh, an entire country or a whole region. Another major change that we'll discuss is the change in how these are used, uh, how technology has changed and uh, the military has integrated uh, a lot of their equipment with civilian equipment, everything from satellites, GPS, uh, you name it. Government have integrated these technologies to the point where they're inseparable. <clears throat> that means that your, your civilian services are now targeted just as much as a uh, soldier in the field. Um, don't mean to, again, I'm not trying to scare everyone, just letting you know that the topic today about power outages uh, can, and military conflicts can uh, lead to loss of civilian services. Next slide, please. Uh, these areas in red are areas that are predicting serious power problems over the next 10 years. Uh, part of this is due to, you know, supply chain, global conflicts, uh, and uh, lack of energy. Uh, the world is trying to go to a more green energy source, but there is not, uh, the world is just not prepared at this time to convert over. So there's a lot of growing pains going on right now in the world. And with the conflicts, also happening at the same time, uh, the system is very vulnerable. Next slide. Uh, I, I will talk about Thailand specifically, but just to, so you can rest a little easier, Thailand is one of the better uh, countries. It's, uh, it's not in red. It's not in red. Um, I'll get into that a little more, uh, but we are in one of the better places in the world. Next slide. What happens at the power grid goes down. <clears throat> Would you know the difference between a blackout, a brownout, or something more serious? Um, 
blackouts, we've all experienced them. The power goes down because uh, a car hits a telephone pole up the road, electrical strike to a transformer nearby. Those are generally very short outages. Uh, we all know how to live with that. I'm, I'm not really referring to that kind of problem. Uh, what can happen, though, as we have more serious energy shortages, is blackouts can be of a much longer term. Uh, when power goes out and the power grid is affected, uh, there's different sections and distribution points where the power uh, could be affected and shut down. So we call those rolling blackouts when, say, uh, a large portion of a country is down uh, and it may be uh, not, it's not an automated outage. This is an uh, unexpected outage. Those outages can go from district to district and uh, start shutting down different systems automatically. When we have those kind of outages, um, they are dangerous to your personal electronics. I'll explain that in a minute. <coughs> Actually, let me, I'm sorry, let me cover that now. So when we have a blackout, obviously your, your device is not in danger during a blackout. Uh, you have a lot of devices that have battery backups that will run on backup power for a while. But when the power comes back on, anything that's plugged in is susceptible to power spikes. Generally, when the power comes on, uh, things like refrigerators start drawing a large amount of power, air conditioners, and uh, there's a, a huge load put on the system. The longer the power outage happens, the more severe the spikes and fluctuation in voltages when the power comes back on. So it's important to understand this, and I recommend you do not turn your power, uh, plug something back in uh, for, say, 20 minutes until after the power has stabilized when power is returned. Another condition we'll talk about in more detail is an EMP, which uh, you may be surprised to hear appears to be the exact same thing as the blackout at first. Only you'll notice that much more systems are affected, possibly satellite, GPS, internet, your cell phone will be down as well as your power in your house. Uh, I'll cover more on this in a little bit. And the third topic is brownouts. Now, brownouts is when the power is uh, reduced. This is generally done directly and intentionally uh, by the supply company. Uh, normally, it's about a 20%, 30% drop of power in your normal feed. So you may notice this because your lights start to flicker, uh, the bulbs may be dull, you're no longer able to connect to the internet, your Wi-Fi disconnects and, and connects sporadically. Uh, a number of different electrical systems may work and some may not, depending on the voltage and the sensitivity of the electrical equipment. This is a very dangerous uh, condition for your electric devices because it can damage a lot of the sensitive equipment. It's also dangerous because it's, you may not notice it. Um, these conditions uh, generally are told in advance to the public through news broadcasts. Uh, and again, you should not be plugging things in during this time frame. And uh, if possible, you want to disconnect all your equipment or most of it because it's all susceptible to damage or being destroyed uh, during a brownout. Next slide. A little more explanation of a brownout. <clears throat> uh, if you happen to notice there's a brownout condition coming, uh, it suggests unplugging uh, especially your important electronics, phone, computer. Uh, a lot of your appliances uh, are more difficult, um, but if at all possible, unplug them. Uh, internet connection and cell phones. Cell phones generally won't be impacted by a brownout, but uh, your internet connection with your local equipment in your, your home probably will be. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is kind of a summary before we get into a lot of details, but I'm trying to give you an idea of the assessment of the risks for these three different conditions. In the case of a blackout, the risk to your devices is fairly low, but also understand that the risk to your devices is more of an accumulative problem. In other words, your electronics, uh, integrated circuit boards are very uh, susceptible to uh, spikes in the power. They're designed to run at a 
specific uh, power level. When there's unreliable power, whether it be too high or too low, uh, it can cause damage to the electronics. And I'm sure we've all had situations where you turn your computer off at night and it was working fine and try to turn it up the next day and it doesn't work. Um, majority of the times when you have damage like that, it's a cumulative. So your device may have been uh, damaged several times in the past uh, due to power spikes in the building or some other conditions. Um, but one day it's just too much and the circuit boards just stop working altogether. Uh, in most of these cases, it's not something you can just easily define what circuit is damaged. So it's usually easier to re replace the entire system than try to figure out what the device is that, uh, what part of the device is damaged and replace it. Brownouts, as I mentioned, are a little bit more damaging, also less easy to detect. And again, uh, both of these blackout and brownout conditions, you can take actions to protect your equipment. Uh, in both cases, they're, gen they're identical uh, protective methods, plugging UPS your devices into UPS systems uh, helps. Uh, they're generally a, a big battery back pack that you would uh, have in front of your uh, PC or other devices you would plug in that are sensitive. So the power to the computer or the phones that you're charging is running off a battery, which stabilizes the voltage. So the incoming power may fluctuate, but the UPS system helps protect your device uh, by not drawing power directly to the sensitive piece of equipment. Keep in mind if those battery uh, UPS systems, the batteries tend to last about three years. After that, the batteries won't be effective. You need to test those once in a while and replace the batteries or they're completely useless and the power goes directly through the UPS un, unfiltered and can damage your device as if it wasn't there. The other piece of equipment that can protect you is surge suppressors. Um, there's low quality surge suppressors and high quality surge suppressors. Um, the better one are gonna protect you better but they help protect against power spikes. Uh, relatively inexpensive way to protect some of your sensitive equipment. I recommend everyone has at least uh, surge suppressors for their sensitive equipment, phones, computers, um, and other equipment. Uh, even TVs and things like that should be on surge suppressors in your house. <coughs> EMPs, as we'll discuss more, uh, are extremely high risk uh, because of the damage they can cause. Well, in, in the past you would not expect these to be major concerns. Uh, today it's more of a risk than ever before. Uh, the risk is several stages. Um, an EMP blast uh, is something that does not affect the person. It could happen at high altitude. You would never know it, never hear it, never see it. But it will take out all your equipment. And it does that um, it does that with uh, within a, a millisecond. So it's not something you can fix after or prepare. F if you haven't fully prepared before it happens, uh, there's nothing you can do. Your equipment's fried after it happens. Uh, there is a way to protect against that with something called uh, a Faraday bag. Now, it's got a funny name. It's ma named after the inventor. Um, but this is basically shielding your equipment from these EMP radiation frequencies. Um, and it's really cheap to build them. Basically, you're insulating uh, your phone, your laptop, uh, from these waves, uh, radiation waves that can come off an EMP blast. Um, unfortunately, they're not readily available in Thailand, but I can explain how you would build one of these yourself. It's quite simple. You take a, a laptop or a, a phone and you put it in a plastic bag so it's in a non-conductive sealed bag and then you uh, wrap that around with some kind of metal, completely enclosed in a metal, say a garbage can or a, a simple uh, metal mesh, aluminum foil, thick aluminum foil would work. 
and what happens is the EMP frequency is, will hit the metal and it will be absorbed at the metal, but it won't be absorbed by the device inside the bag since it's isolated. Uh, there are a lot of products on the market for this. The first picture up in the top is a EMP protected bag. It looks like a standard bag, except it's got a, a layer of metal insulating the inside components from uh, an EMP shock. This picture over here is of a key fob, which many items you probably don't think of as electronic, but your new cars that are keyless are all electronic controlled key fobs, which would all be fried by electronic device. Uh, another simple solution here is a garbage can. And these, uh, this suitcase over here is insulated with uh, a metal frame as well. Keep in mind, you have to keep the device inside uh, insulated from the outside casing. And the metal wrapping around the device has to be complete. If you have any small gaps, uh, the frequency would go through and you could have some damage from the device. Uh, let's see. Next slide, yep. So here are some typical items that could be uh, damaged by an EMP. On the left side are common household items that you might have. On the right side are more critical services that will likely have some damage or be unavailable during a large EMP attack. <coughs> okay. Somehow we got the slides a little out of order. <coughs> so EMPs uh, can be a nuclear in a nuclear bomb. Uh, if a nuclear bomb is set off, it'll have a EMP effect as well as the explosion itself. But that's not, uh, that's not what we're really focused on with this. What we're talking about is the uh, side effects of the radiation pulse that's sent out happens to coordinate with an EMP bomb. But if you set off any of an EMP with the intention of doing damage to uh, an infrastructure, whether it be a building, a city, or a country, uh, you can use different size EMP uh, blasts to uh, destroy all the electronics in that area. Here's uh, some interesting pictures of how EMPs are used today. Uh, they're in satellites and drones, handheld devices. Even uh, Chinese even have a submarine that's totally dedicated to, as an EMP weapon. Uh, aircraft, aircraft and drones and missiles are being used uh, right now around the world with these technologies. The one on the end here is a picture of an e I'll go back to that slide for one moment. The one in the corner here shows how EMPs can be used in a security gate to disable vehicles as they approach the gate uh, if they feel that they're a threat. Uh, Setting off the EMP has a very narrow range uh, to disable all the vehicles and all the electronics in the vehicle in front of it. Next slide. Uh, has EMP weapons been used? Yes. Uh, I, I'm, as the video in, at the beginning be showed, uh, EMP weapons have been used since uh, nuclear bombs have been invented. Discovered in the 1950s, uh, they began to understand that they could use these technologies to disable electronics. Uh, at the time, we weren't, our society wasn't based on electronics. Uh, you know, the military was more so, uh, but today our society is so integrated with electronics, this is extremely damaging has the capability to be extremely damaging and it's now used quite commonly. Uh, you can last few here are very common recent events that was used. <coughs> As I mentioned, EMPs are not necessarily nuclear. There's chemical reactions you can do 
due to uh, make EMPs. And uh, you can actually hand make a handheld EMP. Not that I'm recommending it, I'm just saying this technology is, is uh, very available. Uh, with these little handheld ones, you could probably make for a thousand baht. Uh, you could hold it next to or near a computer or an iPhone, and it has potential to fry it or damage it. Uh, it depends on what the intent of the user is. If you use low voltage, it could damage it or temporarily uh, freeze it. If you use high voltage, it could fry the electronics. Next slide. I already covered that. Okay, we'll go to we'll go to Q and A. Uh, this I'm missing several slides in this brief somehow. Um, okay. So Q and A I think will be interesting. Um, start anywhere. Anyone have questions? Hello? Oh, yep. So, so uh, an EMP attack can uh, disrupt data as well, correct? Yes. Uh, so do banks have anything in place that is running all the time that protects them from EMPs, or is it impossible to do that? Uh, very good question. EMPs can damage data and hard drives and computers, uh, banks, the military, most infrastructure has been preparing for EMP attacks for many years. Uh, but according to a lot of reports, um, they're only a fraction of the equipment and the, the protection that they need. Um, again, it, it doesn't, you don't have to take out uh, everything for it to be a serious implication, a serious problems. If you take out certain key points, critical infrastructure, how do you fix it? Um, so, uh, speaking specifically about your data drives, if your computer or your phone uh, is subject to an EMP, will the data on the phones be damaged or on the computers be damaged? Um, it varies. There is some shieldings in phones and computers, if there's metal plates covering the sensitive peaches. Uh, hard drives, the old style hard drives are ma magnetic, so they're less susceptible to damage, but the controllers that read and write them are subject to uh, damage from an EMP. So while your data would still be on an old hard drive, you may need to replace a controller in order to get it access to that data again. The new SSD drives and USB drives are entirely electronic, so they would probably be fried. Again, putting them in a Faraday bag is the way to protect them. Um, you spoke about the basic level of protection. I believe you called it a surge compression. Is that like a surge protector, like that outlet strip that you just plug yeah. in and then you plug your electronic devices into it and then they're protected when they're, yes. as long as that's not blown, then you're protected. That's the basic level? Yeah. Okay. Be careful what's a power cord extension with multiple plugs on it, which has no protection. Then you have a very simple surge suppressor. We'll have a rating on it. And obviously, you're going to pay more for a more advanced surge suppressor. But what you want to find one is that's got a relatively good amount of protection, and it'll shut off surges that go to your devices. And that's called a surge suppressor. Thanks. Hello, Bud. It's a very yeah. interesting conversation. And to a normal mind like me, it's frightening. Um, and the knowledge that you must have is really sort of deep and I would think worrying to you. Um, my question is, um, I don't quite understand how this would affect electric cars if they're plugged in. Will it fry their batteries? Will it fry their electronics? And why are they flogging electric cars? I can't understand that. The power that is being pushed out generally in the world is not enough to, for the world to utilize. You know, uh, it seems, there seems to be a bit of a quandary here. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, my, my intent to for this presentation is sort of show you how to protect yourself, how to prepare, and what to do before these events happen and what to do after. And understanding how they affect your vehicle 
or your other personal devices is very important and you can do things to protect yourself. In the case of an electric car, uh, if your power grid is down and um, a situation with a long-term outage, you're going to last as long as the charge lasts. So that's a, a big problem. I actually had one, video, uh, one slide I was going to present that covered uh, uh, this, this question. Um, but even gas-powered cars uh, are just as susceptible because you have a full tank of gas, power goes down, electric, let's say there's a blackout for two weeks. Well, you've got enough gas in that car to last a few days. After that, the gas stations can't work because they run on electricity to pump the gas. The trucks can't deliver the gas because their diesel needs to be taken off the ships, put into the trucks. All that is electric. So while the threat of an EMP is serious directly, the indirect threat, threat which is how it affects society, is probably a bigger concern. So being prepared. And uh, after this brief, I'll have a, a group of tips uh, of how to protect yourself from these three uh, issues available. Uh, if you want to give me your email address, I can send it to you electronically, or I have a few copies with me. OK. So you can take a quick look at this, but it's a little scary on the top section. Uh, we're talking about the estimates of how much damage would be done to, through an EMP. Uh, it's unknown because this has never happened. Be, uh, you know, society is very complicated how electronics interacts with other electronics in order to function. Uh, so these are best guesses. Uh, as the example of a car, if you happen to have your car parked underground, uh, it can be somewhat protected. Uh, each car is different because of the way where the electronics are put in the car may be partially shielded from the metal in the car. Um, so. As I pointed out in that last slide, um, your best bet may be a bicycle in that situation, uh, at least to get around. And some of us might have a bicycle with something to tow on it. The first two on top are actually, or three, excuse me, are solar powered bicycles. So uh, it might seem extreme now. I have a feeling in the next few years they're going to be very common. Next question. Yeah, this is a. Uh Related to your presentation, by the way, thank you very much. Very uh, good information and heightened my awareness. Uh, a related question, which may be another whole topic for you, <clears throat> is uh, protecting the human body from electromagnetic frequencies. In the 1950s, <clears throat> there's a scientist, William Reich, who discovered an etheric type of energy called orgone. I ordered recently from Australia a company that, that sells orgone products that you can put in your room to help protect you from radiation, electromagnetic frequencies. Um, any, any comment about that? Yes, there's, there's basically two ways to protect yourself and your equipment in your home from uh, EMP uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, damage. The first is the small, smaller Faraday cages I mentioned. It's also a more sophisticated way that is basically like a very large surge suppressor in your house or in your car that's plugged into the uh, electrical connections that will rapidly cut off uh, any surges that are detected. Um, in the case of an EMP, there's actually three different waves. One, the first wave is um, within a, a fraction of a millisecond, and that's a very dangerous wave. The second wave is more comparable to lightning. And then the third wave, which is uh, uh, indirect consequence, where the power lines are, in, uh, are uh, the resurges in the power lines for several minutes, uh, as the, uh, the EMP can actually affect the shielding of the planet. And uh, the expectation is that uh, your power spikes will be pretty severe. Um, so there's multiple frequencies involved in protecting from an EMP. Um, you'll see a lot of products on the market today that talk about RFID chips and how to protect your 
key fob, for example, uh, or your wallet, for that matter, um, uh, by putting them in these containers. That, that may work for radio frequencies, common radio frequencies, uh, but it may not protect against all EMP frequencies. Um, the two methods that uh, we're talking about here, the, the second one this gentleman just mentioned, uh, is a way to shield an entire house or a car. Those are quite expensive. They generally start at three to five or six hundred US dollar and uh, they're not available in Thailand. I've only found them in the US, but apparently I'm sure they're in uh, Australia and Europe as well. I am trying to import some of the materials needed to build those and may, may have those available in the near future. Um, I have an example here I could show people if you're interested. Um, the other part that we didn't get to display on the screen I'll mention is uh, what to do when you have power outage. Uh, so it's not as simple as just having your power outage and turning on the candles. Um, if your society is, is uh, or at least your local area is fairly impacted, your phone's out, you have no electricity, uh, there's a number, number of critical things I'd recommend you do from filling up your bathtub with water because if your power's out for three days, how do you flush your toilet? Um, many of these kind of small things they might seem small, but when you're actually in a power outage, they can become very important. If you have a refrigerator full of foods and a freezer with frozen foods, um, don't open your refrigerator or freezer more than you need to. Make sure your uh, freezer is full of ice prior to this event, and your food would last three or four more days before it goes bad. Um, Next, next question. Um, hello. Um, so two questions. First one, um, solar panels um, not affected by EMPs? Solar panels are not destroyed, generally not destroyed uh, from an EMP. They're likely to be degraded and damaged, whether it be 20 or 60 percent. There's a lot of variables that decide that. Uh, solar panels that are out in, in use. You can protect smaller ones. I have an example of a solar panel for a, for a phone charger. Uh, solar panel, uh, they actually come in, in their backpacks too where the whole outside of the backpack is a solar charger. So there's a lot of neat products out there you can get that, to help you through yeah. difficult times. But having a, a panel, say, hung on your house, yeah. um, chances are they'll be somewhat degraded but still work. And I say okay. de de degraded, uh, you know, the amount of electricity they can produce will be less, but they will, they will survive. Okay. Um, second question. Um, so EMPs sound like a, an extremely efficient weapon of war. And um, I'm curious as to why, like, for example, Ukraine, Russia, why, why, the, why they're not, why it's not being used? It sounds like you could bring a country to its knees very easily. It is being used daily, uh, literally, uh, but it's being used in a very focused, limited means. In other words, uh, both sides might use uh, handheld or small uh, EMP weapons to take down drones or fighters. We also use in drones and fighters to, to disable uh, ground radar and defensive systems. But the reason they haven't used it, mm. the reason they haven't used it in a uh, larger capacity is because of the massive damage they know it does that's in possibly irreparable. Um, if you set these off uh, very low or, or very focused weapons, you can do temporary damage with a low voltage or you can do permanent damage with higher voltage. Um, nobody really knows, no matter how much they've researched this, they can't emulate the complexity of the real world. So nobody knows for sure how much damage would be done. But if you take out an entire country, um, I can't even comprehend how you would ever bring that back. Uh, an example would be uh, the transformers on the uh, electrical grid. Now the larger transformers in, let's say, the US, if you took uh, one of these out, they do get damaged. They take about two to two and a half years to build. 
and they're only built outside of the U.S. The U.S. has no capability to build them within the U.S. So what happens when you have 300 of these gone at the same time? Uh, that's just a small example of how you even turn the electricity back on. Um, so I don't think it's to anybody's benefit to use these in a, a large scale. Uh, they're being used more focused, but there are several, several situations where they might have unintentionally being, might unintentionally be used uh, in this way. Now, the higher you go in the atmosphere when you set off uh, a nuclear weapon, for example, um, the more dangerous it is. So you could take a weapon that was, let's say, North Korea uh, shot a weapon at the U.S. and it was intercepted by U.S. missiles over Japan at uh, you know 100,000 feet up. Uh, that's like one of the worst scenarios you can think of because it would take out a large part of China, South Korea, all of Japan. Uh, again, unintentional. The intent was to shoot down a, a missile reaction may cause a bigger problem. Um, so they've been very restrained to use this in a large capacity so far, but that's the risk. We, we don't know what might happen in the future and conflicts are getting more and more uh, complex and uh, accidents happen. Um, th thanks for the presentation, bud. Um, my question is, is why should we bother? Let me, let me put that in context. <laughs> Let's say I put a Faraday cage around my house and I protect all my electronics. Okay, good, my phone works, my computer works, life is good. The electric grid is out, I can no longer charge my devices. The cellular network's out, I can no longer communicate. Broadband internet is out, I can't communicate. So I can use my devices until the batteries go dead and like, why, why, why would I bother going to the effort because Society's going to collapse at that point because, you know, the banks aren't working, so you can't get money out of the ATM. Anything I had in my account now doesn't exist. It's only the cash I have on hand. There's going to be way bigger problems than me being able to play games on my phone that still has some battery left. Uh, agreed. Uh, there's going to be a lot of serious... Uh, that's the worst-case scenario, okay? Uh, if, let's say, there's a conflict in Taiwan, uh, and uh, an EMP was used at high altitude, intentional or not, that could impact Thailand, but to a small degree. In other words, I'd expect 10% of the equipment to be damaged. Um, the, the situation uh, with EMPs is how to keep your personal devices still working in, in not a worst, worst case scenarios. Um, you know, uh, if they decide to use this in a large capacity, it's the same problem we have with use of nuclear weapons. Do you really want to survive? That's a, that's a personal choice if you want to go quick or you want to be around and possibly survive after a, a very difficult time. Um, again, I focused this presentation on understanding what you can do to prepare so that you can at least get information, know where to go. Uh, by using your personal devices after having a radio, uh, protected during a blast would be a good idea, having not just your phone and your computer, but you, I'm sure most of us have all our contacts information in the phone. Um, you can download YouTube videos on how to purify water, how to survive, um, and you might, you know, a lot of us might want to do that. I'm not suggesting being a severe, you know, prepper, but knowing how to communicate with associates and friends and help each other get through some difficult times is the best we can do and hope that it's not a global problem. Um, any other questions? As Bud said to me before he gave this talk, he said, I hope all the information in this talk is useless and it's never needed. Uh, I have a few uh, question and answer slides uh, we can get to in a moment, but let's, Carol, let's let everyone ask their questions first. Uh, my, my question is uh, uh, in an EMP uh, scenario, and, uh, you know, I don't have the Faraday coverage, and, you know, my cell phone uh, fry, uh, is fried, and my laptop and all that stuff. Um, you, would you not still be protected by uh, the cloud? Like, 
the most important losses for me would be data and, and those type of things. The facts that, that I can't go to an ATM uh, with my credit card because my credit card is fried. Uh, th these would be, I, I think, temporary, but, but losses like data would be really hurtful. So would, would clouds protect all that? Uh, understood, and, and that's the great unknown because uh, the inter internet is very robust, but it depends on how widespread an EMP was. As, I s as you've seen, examples here can take out the United States in one, one blast. And again, this doesn't have to be a large blast. This is a small nuclear bomb uh, or an EMP, chemical EMP. Uh, just has to be set up high enough, set off high enough in the atmosphere. Um, data centers uh, might be a primary target, um, but your question about are they protected? Yes, they do have protection. Uh, some of the better protections, as far as some are underground, most are heavily shielded. Um, but the internet itself is not. And if you happen to be at your house, uh, your home here in Thailand, uh, you're, you're probably not in the direct line of sight. You're an unintentional consequence. Um, but if your router, uh, your cell phone, your equipment is damaged, uh, you don't have access to your devices, uh, or excuse me, to your data. Uh, they may go offline if uh, one hits, where well, the electrical grid is down, but it'll probably come back up at some point. Um, so your point is, is a val valid one. The equipment may be saved. Um, but keep in mind that if it's a fairly large spread area, that could be six months to two years uh, that might be uh, a down. So you'll need to survive during that time frame. Um, and uh, that's easier said than done if you don't have electronics. Uh, again, a couple other areas that might be important to, to cover when we talk about damage. Uh, a lot of us have cryptocurrencies, crypto wallets. Uh, you have a safe in your condo with a combination, it's electronic. Uh, you have an access card to your condominium or your home to enter it, or gates. These are all potentially fried. I'd suggest putting all of these, uh, at least a backup, a spare, along with your key fob, into one of these Faraday bags that protects your equipment in case the worst scenario happens. Next question. Uh, for me, it's uh, really confusing, as uh, Brian can confirm with that. Um, I'm one of these dinosaurs that has not got into any electronic whatsoever. My question is, I have many friends who have diesel generators. How will they, they won't even rely on electricity. They're actually producing their own electricity. How will they be affected? And especially, if you have an old uh, diesel generator, like a gardener that works on compression, how will they be affected? So an old diesel system that is not so heavily uh, electronic would have a good chance of surviving without damage. Even modern ones would probably survive. They may need a few tweaks. Uh, maybe a, one circuit might have been burned out. But it's only going to last as long as the diesel will last. Um, so if you're, the main, the main point here is the electrical grid that we all depend our, on for our life. If that goes down for any length of time, uh, I suggest you have a, a plan in place on what to do. Um, again, I have some suggestions, uh, about 30 different steps that you can take uh, that may be helpful. Um, I think you'd be okay for a couple weeks with a diesel generator, but after that, you wouldn't want to be out looking for diesel. We mentioned blackouts and brownouts. Um, most estates, the power comes in as three phase, and very few houses actually use three phase. So what effect does losing a phase happen on any equipment in your house? Very good question, and this is why the energy... Uh, test, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three.